Would you like to be the kind of business leader who wants to define problems and design solutions based on rigorous research? Are you seeking a global part-time program that goes beyond the masters? Do you like the idea of being a chef as opposed to being a cook? Tune into this podcast, the director of Grenoble's DBA program. Welcome to the 315th episode of Mission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. I'm Linda Abraham, the founder of Accepted and the host of this podcast. My mission and passion is to help you show that you both fit in at your target schools and are a standout in the applicant pool. The result? You get a message one day that causes you to jump up, uh, up and down shouting, yes, I'm in, and not only in, but in at the best program for you. The featured resource for today's show is Fitting In and Standing Out, The Paradox at the Heart of Admissions. Your application needs to show that you will do both, and that's a difficult paradox at, that's at the heart of any application and admissions process. Master that paradox, and you are well on your way to acceptance. Download this free guide at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O, as in fitting in, standing out. Again, that's accepted.com slash F-I-S-O for your free guide. Our guest today, Dr. Michelle Miele, does a lot of different things as assistant associate professor of, I'm going to try that again. Our guest today, Dr. Michelle Miele, does a lot of different things as associate professor at the Grenoble Ecole de Management, also known as GEM where she's been since 2010. I'm not going to list them all, but the most relevant role for us today is as academic director of the DBA US for GEM. Originally from the US, Dr. Miele earned her bachelor's at Southwestern University in Texas, a master's from Penn State and Harvard, and her PhD in anthropology and Francophone civilization is also from Harvard. She has worked in France, the US, the Ivory Coast, and Central America. Dr. Miele, welcome to Emission Straight Talk. Our guest today, Dr. Michelle Miele, does a lot of different things as associate professor at the Grenoble Ecole de Management, also known as GEM, which I find a lot easier to pronounce since I don't know French, where she's been since 2010. I'm not going to list all the things that she does, but the most relevant role for us today is as academic director of the DBA US for GEM. Originally from the US, Dr. Miele earned her bachelor's at Southwestern University in Texas, a master's from Penn State and Harvard, and her PhD in anthropology and Francophone civilization is also from Harvard. She has worked in France, the US, the Ivory Coast, and Central America. Dr. Miele, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Now, I want to start with two really basic questions, but they are, I think they are ones that at least a segment of listeners are going to have. And the first one is, what's the difference between a PhD and a DBA? Right. So that's a great question, Linda. Uh, and that's often one that we get. They're very similar. In essence, they're both doctoral qualifications. They're, the, they're terminal degrees. So after you do those, you can't go higher unless you are in academia for many years. And then there's always something else you can do, right? You can become an emeritus later, etc. But they're the same. And simply the name is different because one really designates that it's a part-time, traditionally it's been a part-time program, number one. Number two, it is in business administration, as it, so it's a professional qualification as opposed to a purely academic qualification. And so it is for people who are either practitioners in management or people wanting to do a more applied management doctoral research kind of thesis. So it's a little bit more applied, it's a little bit more for practitioners, and it's often linked to part-time status and professional status. So it's a little bit less academic, let's say, in terms of the contribution that we're expecting from someone who would have a pure academic career. So it's a hybrid, if you will. Okay. It still has a lot of the ingredients of the PhD, and we are you know, often really looking to keep it very close to the same level, because at our school we have PhD and DBA, so we compare notes a lot. And they're very similar, but the level of contribution we'll ask them to have with their thesis will be more on the managerial side or the practitioner side and a little bit less on the theoretical side, but they need both. 
So they need well, management. Well, it sounds like and, I was given a clinical, a, a clinical degree as opposed to a, a, a research a, or a strictly research oriented degree. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot like that because it's clinical in the sense that they have, are really examining a phenomenon in the field and they're applying solutions to it based on original research and their own data, but also based on what they're observing and the things that are in the literature that can feed into that, right? Um, so it's very hypothesis, a hypothesis and then proving or disproving that, that hypothesis. Right. So when they do qu quantitative, they're hypothesizing. When they're doing qualitative, they're, they're formulating propositions and then they're testing those propositions, right? Okay. So it's interesting. Now, what can someone with a DBA do that, let's say, an MBA or another master's holder in business can't do? So yeah, so that's a good one because we, we like to look at that. We get we look for people who have an MBA or really good masters. And we we tell them when you were in an MBA program, it's very rigorous and very intense, but you're basically working on often on a case method and you're learning how to establish and practice and replicate good recipes, right? So you are getting you have the ingredients and the recipes and you're cooking up great solutions for organizations. But the difference is when you go for a doctorate, you are writing the recipe. You're behind the wheel. Nobody else has written it. So all the things that you learned in the MBA are great because your mind has learned to think in a way which is solutions oriented. But the DBA is problem oriented. A doctoral work is what are the problems? We don't know about solutions yet. We're trying to figure out what the problems are. We just want to hear the pain and we don't want to try to address the pain. The only way we can address the pain is by finding more pain, <laughs> right? So it's a very different <laughs> approach. Don't really want to do that, but uh, I noticed that your colleague, um, was, uh, I'm looking for a name, Dr. Valerie. Uh, yeah, Valerie. She, in one of the videos, I was, I was, you know, researching the program before the, the call, and that's exactly the, the metaphor she used. She said. Um, in, in a master's program, you have the recipe and, and, you, and you're a cook, you, you cook the recipe. When you're right. in the DBA program, you become a chef. You're actually creating right. the recipe. You're creating the you're recipe. You're creating it and you're testing it and you, you're, you're kind of like the, the master cook who, who says, but if I do this, if I tweak it this way, I can do this. So you're looking for different outcomes and you're less, you have a lot less certitude and it's also fun because you get lost in trying to figure out all the different ingredients of the recipe that would make it great. So there's a period where you're exploring. It's very different, right? It's a lot of fun, but it also means that you really change your mindset from, you know, let's say an implied, we're only finding solutions to, we're also just going to ask really good questions, which is a great skill that the MBA does give you, right? You ask good questions. Right. Now, that's the difference in, in focus between the DBA and the MBA, for example. Right. But in terms of professional opportunities after the degree, I mean, what what is the difference what do you there? Do? Beyond, yeah, outside of academia. I, I'm, exactly. I'm going to academia, but is there, what are the benefits? Exactly. So we, we have a lot of different outcomes for that. Like here in the US, I have uh, someone who was working in an investment firm and he did the DBA to create his own algorithm for a hedge fund that uh, he could use for socially responsible investment, for example, creating his own index. So he could never have done that if he had not spent four years really homing in on very specific skills in quantitative, but also in finance to see the huge body of knowledge out there. And you kind of figure that out when you're in your MBA, you go, wow, there's a lot out there. And you realize that when you start writing your thesis, if you have one, and then when you get to a doctorate, you really need to know it. You start looking at all of it and saying, well, what can I contribute to that is original research, but that I can use? So a lot of people in investment and finance, they will go right back into that. But then they're, they're, they've moved to a new level. They've created a product that then is a, is a financial, it's a, it's a profit centered, profit generating activity for them because they have expertise that you need four years to develop, right? Or three years, whatever time it takes. Um, other people will be senior consultants in a practice. So sometimes they would be like, for example, I've had a few people who were chief marketing officers or global marketing director of, of large companies. And 
well, after the DBA, they don't necessarily want to do that anymore, but that's been their, their source of data or that's been their inspiration. But then they become, once they have a doctorate, very attractive to the consulting firms, right? So I've had people go to work for Rollenberger or Accenture or different firms who, or even you know, boutique firms very specialized in specific types of market research. So they can go on, you know, I, I hate to use the word thought leader, it's kind of overused, but they do become either, let's say, managerial thought leaders because they can translate all of this research to people who don't do research and people right. in organizations need that. Um, but they also are the person in the room who knows more. So if they stay in organizations, it's great because they tend to be, have such expertise. They're the person in the room that becomes the reference. People need those people to look to for specific topics, especially if it's in any kind of technical field. Um, when you look at innovation management, for example, some of these people work on lead user theory uh, and you need to understand how to lead users operate in innovation environments, open innovation, for example. So those people are literally the people in the room who know more about the subject than anyone else. And they're usually very welcome in their organizations they go to or consulting they're firms they work for. They're experts. What's distinctive about the GEM DBA program? Um, it's not the only one in the world, obviously. So what, what are its, it's particular calling cards? Yeah, so, so Grenoble, I mean, it, it's, we've been around since 1993, right? So it's 26 years. We have practice now and we've learned how to work very well with students who are part-time and also who are remotely located, right? So that's part of the, the piece of it is, is you have to know how to manage people remotely who are very busy. And all DBA programs who are part-time, uh, they have to do that. Yeah. But our difference is, is that we have found ourselves very good at preparing people who go into, first of all, they transition to academia. So one of the things we're very good at is helping people who are managers, but who like to teach. Sometimes people will pick up a class or two as a, an evening class they'll teach and they realize they love it. And they're ready to do something else and not necessarily something that's gonna increase their salary to a great extent, they don't want to become, they don't want to move up anymore, they want to slow down. And often those kind of people like to transition to academia where they can still have a very good salary and still do interesting things, but they're not doing the same type of work and they love student contact, right? Another area we're good at is helping people who are consultants become better by having more, much more scientifically grounded arguments and methods for getting data, for working with clients. So those are the areas where we're, we're very good and I think that we have a track record of very high visibility for a DBA program so our students publish a lot we push them to we have a paper-based thesis possibility for a lot of them the US program people do tend to use that option because they can write papers and publish them as opposed to doing a traditional long monograph thesis they call it right and that that's what it really what makes us different as you can really look up the work by our students is is quite impressive because they're going to academic and practitioner conferences worldwide because we have students literally on every continent. And so they're impacting either universities and students in, in business schools or they're really impacting people in the world of management and organizations. So I think that's what meant ours is also spread out. So we have students in China because we have a, a large uh, constituency of students in China, but also in the Middle East. Historically, we've had programs in Lebanon and in Saudi Arabia. So we have a lot of really, really great alumni from those places. Well, now and you have one in Istanbul, students. don't you? You have one Pardon? in Istanbul. You have one, uh, just started one in Istanbul. That's going to be kind of our new hub for the Middle East slash Central Europe, right? So we're, gonna, we're moving to Istanbul, and that's going to be very nice because it can pull in people from East and West and South. So. Right. So, so the, you know, so we've got these programs worldwide, which means that the students are coming in with these problems that are very rooted in a local ecosystem. Right. And that's been really interesting for us to have all these reviewers who can come in and they'll look at a problem going on in, let's say, Chinese biomedical bio startups. And, um, and then the next time they'll turn around and they'll be looking at how do migrant farm workers in California communicate? What kind of, do they use WhatsApp or Messenger more? Like those kind of problems that are, they sound basic, but they're, they end up getting into very interesting scientific. Well, they get into the why, why they're using one over the other, I would assume. 
probably exactly it's really right? interesting right so yeah those are the kind of things so it's interesting for people who work with us because they learn about all these you know contexts that they would never have access to otherwise right it's really exciting now it, it is in, in preparing for the call your your colleague valerie who's the director of the gem doctoral schools um she focused a lot on the uh, on the concept of relevant research can you dive into that a bit i mean we also corresponded a bit about it absolutely yes thank you so yes valerie and i that's something that we hold dear to our heart is that we're very clear on the idea that our dbas are necessarily working on things that matter and it's not to say that research even research that may appear often uh, ridiculously minute and in kind of focus always matters right but what we mean by that is that by taking on people who are part-time they're working in organizations they have to be supporting themselves while they're doing this and so they have a tough you know it's it's tough and so the thing that's beautiful about it though is that they have to do something that matters because often their organizations are expecting them to even if they're not financing it and often they're not they're expecting them to be using this for something that people will be able to use so it means that at the end of the day it's not just a conversation among people in the ivory tower right it's a conversation among you know other people who are industry watchdogs or let's say train spotters people who know what's going on in industry they're going to be able to talk to those people to trade journalists and to people who are experts but also they're going to be able to talk to everyday people in the organization who are trying to figure out specific things that are happening that are trends that are often economic cycles and things and they're helping those people too so you know what a great thing to do to say even if it's a, a narrow subject it is often something that people can measure after they've done it it's helping people somebody's using it right, right. so that's the idea of relevancy okay and the the gym dba in particular I mean, most many many doctoral programs draw internationally but the GEM DBA draws students from around the world, as you said, and, you know, Asia, China, the Middle East, Europe, obviously. Um, and it has four physical locations. We mentioned Istanbul. Obviously, there's Grenoble. There's also Los Angeles and New York City. Do the cohorts in these different locations meet all together at specific points in time in their program? Is it a lockstep program? Are there online components to the program or do they, they have to travel regularly to whatever center they're most associated with? How does that all kind of fit together? Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so what we try to do is say people are usually from a geographic location, right? So if someone is in Singapore, they would go to the China program or if they're in yeah, I don't know, Ar Armenia, they would go yeah. to Istanbul, right? But, you know, how it happens is people are, these, some of these global managers are, it's just incredible. They'll say, well, you know, I'm going to miss my workshop because I'm not going to be in China for workshop three, but I'll be in Los Angeles the next month. I can make it up. So, <laughs> so it does happen that people can go to other sites, right? We like that and, and we want right. them to meet each other. But people are, you know, Americans prefer to be able to take their classes on a U.S. campus because it's just easier, right? Because you've organized it for Americans, right? So let's say you have two options. One is if you're in the Grenoble program in France, then, or the Istanbul program, it's based on a, you come and you do one full week of coursework and you're you you know you're there for like five or six days minimum. And then you go back to your job and you come back every three to four months, right? Um, no, it's every six months in that, that sequence is every six months you come for a week and you do that four times. And we do it a little differently for the Americans. We say, you know, we'd rather them have more frequency of contact and um, not have to miss work because we know it's tough for people to miss work. So we do it on a weekend basis. So about every three months over a two year period, you have a, a weekend course. So we do one in Grenoble. The first one is like intro orientation, come to Grenoble, meet us. And then after that, it's all on a US campus, whether it be in Burbank or in New York, which we're starting up. Then it's going to be on a Friday afternoon, Saturday, all, and then part of the day Sunday. People fly home Sunday afternoon, yeah, and that works. Really, really that works quite well, you know. So yeah, the, right. with the Americans, that seems to be the recipe. And uh, and and you're the chefs that created it. And are you are you? Um, is there a time like when they all meet? Well, it's the beginning. They all meet in Grenoble, a specific cohort, right? Right. 
So they definitely meet. So they come to so the way if I walk you through it, they go to Grenoble once, then they have for in the US program, then they'll have five weekends over the next 18 months. And that's and a the workshop. They'll come back to Grenoble and they will okay. defend their pre dissertation defense. So basically, it's a moment to say, I've done this work, I've collected data, I've done a pilot study. And I'm going to come back and present it and get feedback from people who are not my supervisor, from other people who are experts in my field who will give me new feedback. So I triangulate. And then after that, so they, they see their classmates then always. Sometimes it's two classes. Sometimes we organize it so that there's like we had a program in Switzerland. Well, they were with the, the U.S. students. Um, sometimes it'll be the Chinese students will be next to the students based in Grenoble. So we try to mix the cohorts a lot when we can do social things and academic things together. But what's for sure is they always meet at graduation, right? So that's our big moment. And, and then you have a mixture of years because people have different speeds and frequencies of, you know, graduation rates vary a little bit. So some people, it takes them to, let's say the minimum is three, the maximum is five, so people are not always of the same year graduating, and it's kind of a nice thing. You mix people, then you get all the people from different geographies together. But yeah, it's what we didn't do is we thought about a global DBA, and the thing we we found is that people like to have a connection to a community where they, they kind of go through something together. And when you do a global DBA, you move around from one campus to another, right? So we thought, well, we can do a class and we can do a weekend and a week in China, a week in Colombia, I don't know, a week in Istanbul. But when we tested that with students and alumni, they, they didn't like the idea of not having some regularity of place and group. And um, they liked the idea of having a group of people you kind of go through this together with. They enjoyed that. That's what's really cool is probably the people more than anything that you you learn so much from these other very brilliant people who are doing this with you who are also very ambitious people. And um, and it's inspiring because you're meeting people who just impact organizations in very different ways, super different skill sets. And you have people coming in and I had a woman from Lebanon come in and she said, I want to work on breastfeeding. And I said, well, breastfeeding is a sociological studies kind of topic. So it's not really business, but we can look at what you want to do with that. And it, it ended up being public health marketing and breastfeeding. Wow. In Lebanon. Oh, and, you know, that's a great way of saying, well, that's, you know, people were inspired by that, that she was working on something so important as public health. And how do you market? How do you use marketing messages to do that? Um, another example is uh, someone from the U.S., whose name is Ben Powers, and he is a headmaster of the Southport School in Connecticut. And he, this is a school specialized in students with dyslexia. So Ben's thesis was looking at, there's, a, there's been some research on dyslexia and entrepreneurship and a lot of linkages. Uh, really? Dyslexic people tend to go into entrepreneurship and they're very successful. So it's interesting. That's so he's got the entrepreneurial intention among adolescents not only in his school, but across all the schools in his network of schools working with dyslexic children. And so there are interesting things like that where when you, you know, come across people working on these kind of subjects, they're pretty, they're pretty inspiring. So yeah. it's, it's interesting that in, in both the, the breast case feeding and the, the connection between dyslexia and, and entrepreneurship, you think, well, that's not really business, but there really are business connections to, to both. Right. They're always, as long as it's a connection, what I think is nice is that it, it's, people have kind of maybe a narrower idea of the kind of research you can do in management, yeah. but management is a social study, social science field, which combines things from, you know, anthropology, sociology, psychology. So, you know, you, you really can pull in all kinds of interdisciplinary topics of interest, right, that are really yeah. quite interesting and, and fun to work on. How does the GEM DBA program compare in cost to similar U.S. programs? I know you've sometimes been critical of the cost of higher ed in the United States. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a product of the higher education in the United States, and I, you know, I followed carefully the way that it's, you know, there's there is definitely inflation that is, uh, you know, not but exponential but not far. And I think this is, I mean, we're seeing it. There's a crisis in enrollment in, in universities right now. It's, it's, it's really a problem in the United States and it's hitting our economy. So 
we all know something has to be done, but it's it's spun out of control for all kinds of factors. And, you know, so it's easy to criticize. I, under, you know, I don't want to be a blind critic of this, but I do say. I think there are a lot of, a lot of people outside academia that are also criticizing it. I mean, yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, I, I would lo love to try to help fix this because I think that Americans are, you know, going to need this for the future. Um, we cannot be in debt the way we are with education. And so, you know, everybody, the, the world is on a trend towards, let's say, more economic liberalism. And I think higher costs in education will come and it's already coming even to Europe. Right. We're seeing it. But it's a little bit more attenuated because of the way. I would just say it's not socially acceptable to make people go into debt to the same level. And so for many reasons, right? And also it's not feasible to put people's debt ratios to certain levels. And so, uh, you know, our program costs for four years. If you do four years, it costs about $69,000 or 60,000 euros. And so that's 17,000 euros the first two years and 14,000 euros the second two years. So that compares to about a hundred to 150, even higher thousand, hundred fifty thousand dollars. So it's about half, right? Roughly half. Uh, in our program is four years. Other when I say that one hundred fifty thousand number, that's for three year programs in the U.S. So yeah. it's, it's you know it's really significant, and that's one of the reasons people come because they look at the the graduates and what they're doing and they're doing interesting work and there there's a lot of them we just celebrated our 400th graduate which is huge for doctoral programs quite honestly sure. so you know people are looking at that in the u.s and they're they're cost conscious and they see that you know we're going to help them we're triple accredited so we can still help them very much on the job market if they want to go into academia or tenure type jobs you know, and so we we have a way of, of kind of responding to this problem. And I think that's what's happening is European schools and schools outside the U.S. are responding to this problem of, of affordable education. I know when I went to I, I graduated college in the mid 70s and I would I, I went to UCLA for undergraduate and my master's. And at the time, a quarter's a, a quarter's tuition was about the same as one month's rent. <laughs> now wow. I think you know and people were complaining about it actually right but right. um you know I think most of us if we could pay three months rent for a year's tuition we'd be thrilled that's right we would be I mean you know back in the I think it, similarly maybe before the that period I think you could work a summer job to pay for your college education right, right. Right. That was back in my my parents' day. They they would work in the yeah, summer. Yeah, I hesitate myself, but yes. Uh, right. Yeah, it's and, and even and even in Los Angeles with the ridiculous real estate prices that we have, you know, tuition is much more than three months' rent. I'm not to mention right. the rest of the country. But, yes. Uh, I was recently speaking to someone in Los Angeles, and they said they had a very affordable undergraduate program, and they announced to me forty six thousand oh, dollars. Right. And right. that's but that for them, that was really a great price. And I right. I know that they are competitive when they tell me that price for a private school. That, yeah. You know. okay, UCLA, UCLA is, is obviously public, um, but the tuition in the 70s was much less, much, much less than it is today. Right. Um, right. And so graduate program is even higher. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so. so yeah, there's there's um, it's it's a subject of concern, and I just see that our program has, I think, I mean, it's always been popular in the United States because of the way we organized it part time, and we, you know, I think we've always fostered this link to people and organizations. We know how to work with them to motivate them to get them to give us their time and give this work their time that that it deserves, and and share them with their bosses and their families. But I think that also it's increasingly getting down to it's just not affordable and they look at it and they see that you know it's a quick decision to go to Europe and we're not the only school in Europe right so there are others too um, you know there's there's competition in, in the European market but I would say in the in the US um, you know it depends on what you want to do but people paying back this kind of debt to do a doctorate is surprising because a doctorate is not 
traditionally been a profit generator, right? And for right. for a school, right? right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a problem, and it's also combined with the kind of degree inflation that you have in the United States, not specifically in, in business, but in many right. fields where a master's used to be enough, or bachelor's used to be enough, now you need a master's, and where a master's right. used to be enough, now you need you know, a doctor of whatever. So right. kind of squeezing, I think, people and young professionals, essentially, between this, yes. this rising demands and rising costs, and it's, it's very, very difficult. All right, so right. you convinced me, I wanna go, how do I get in? All right, so you have to apply. Right. <laughs> you gotta send us a... What is Research experience required most many many PhD to be short program, but doctoral programs require their applicants to have had some kind of research experience. Does right. the GEM program require that? No, um, we do not. We do not. We we do favor applicants who have written like a master's thesis because we just know they've practiced writing, right? Because if writing is a craft, it's a it's a whole other art. There's all these pieces to it. You have to learn how to do really good data collection and data analysis. So you need to use new tools, right? But the other piece is you have to write. So once you, you know, you know how to use SPSS or Stata or, you know, qualitative analysis software, then you have to write up your results. So we do like people who practice writing, but um, what I see that's hard in our application, but it's way, I think it's a great way to figure out who can do this for us? It's very clear is we require a research proposal with the application and not all schools do that. And it's tough. And we tell people, you know what, you may wanna like um, rekindle the old flame with your MBA profs or <laughs> somebody who you loved as a professor who's an academic who can look at this because you know we're part of the, you know, the admissions committee. We can give you a few pieces of advice, but there's a template that's very clear what they have to do they have to come up with a research question and they have to think about a phenomenon and they have to then go look in the peer reviewed journals and find evidence that this is something original. And so it's not easy. And they're um, actually going to add to the body of knowledge. Yeah. They have to go and look at it. And I mean, I can immediately see some people come back and they're like, I love it. You know, I, this was so interesting. I got lost reading and I realized it's so rich and I just, I want to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. and that's great, you know, or, yeah. or they'll, they'll come back and say, you know, I, I only found 10 articles cause I have to pay for these. And then I say, oh, well, let me show you a trick for finding free articles online, you know, and, and then <laughs> you, start, you start engaging with them and you see they're curious enough and they know it's not going to be easy. And you see, when you work with these seasoned executives, sometimes they don't like to be put in a position of beginner. So that's really key to us is I have a bunch of CEOs, CFOs, you know, and, and you know, heads of, of small startups that are, you know, these brilliant people, but they just haven't done research yet in this way, right? So they have to put themselves in a position to learn and then we can fill their glass, right? Um, see, CEOs don't always like to be told what to do either. They, you know, they may. No. And sometimes yeah. they have very interesting discussions with their supervisors, but <laughs> loving each other because they're different from each other, right? And they, they have this huge respect. Like our faculty, we like we need DBAs because DB. So part-time doctoral programs keep practitioners and academics in the in this discussion that is. I think intellectually keeps you everybody honest, right? Because you have to discuss things that you wouldn't have, you know, you have to explain why do you look at it this way? Why is this the orthodox way to do it? Aren't there other ways? And sometimes academics say, oh gosh, you know, we have this kind of path dependency for doing things this way. And someone else comes and kind of disrupts the way we do it and asks us questions and makes us feel like, oh, well, maybe, maybe that is kind of rigid. But, you know, we do the same with them. Right, uh, right. The way that they're looking at business problems, we say, you know, you got to switch your gears here, and uh, that's not going to be interesting to an academic. I just was just before we spoke, I was correcting a presentation for a conference I'm going to tomorrow, oh, really? and my DBA student who I'm supervising was using a style of a presentation that's a little bit more for a consultant, right? Uh -huh. uh -huh. Business uh -huh. There were too many, yeah. I think, kind of photos or things that. You know, it has to look serious, right? So there are things like that. You just have to kind of adopt a new. So it's kind of like 
it's cool because we have to learn to speak each other's codes. And, you know, that's that's kind of the fun part of it, but it's not the easy part, you know? And that's so, where anthropology comes in, right? That's exactly. Right. In anthropology, right? Different that's cultures. Right. We learn to observe. We Everything is a phenomenon. Everything's interesting, you know? I mean, when you, when you, people tell me when they leave the workshops on the weekends, they get the restaurant, you know, menu, and they start looking at the menu. And, and analyzing the font, the way it's, what it's putting, I mean, they start analyzing everything, right? right? And that's kind of fun. But like, just to go back to the idea of the interviewee and the, so when you apply, you write this proposal, we don't always tell you it's good right away. We sometimes tell you to go back and do work on it. And if people are willing to go back and really work on it, that's a great sign to me right there. So if we didn't have that proposal in the application, I wouldn't know about people's resilience facing the difficulty of the academic you know, process of learning to write and do research. If people are resilient, and even if they're you know, at the top of their field, they're you know, a well-known speaker on a topic, but they can also bend themselves in the direction to be learners again, they're the perfect candidates for us. Okay. Now, just to dive a little bit into what I saw on the website, I noticed that you also wanna have at least five years of work experience uh, in DBA applicants. Is there any particular kind of work experience that you're looking for? I mean, you know, it's good if they've had, when we say five years, it's really, they've been managing people, right? And- um, I mean, what, is the, what is the average age of, of the DBA applicant, of the students? There you go, right? So it means that the, the youngest folks are usually 35 and, you know, then it goes up to, it, there, there's really no age limit. I have people, I've had people in their 70s defend their wow. thesis and it's wonderful. Cool. I think we've actually had someone who was almost 80 actually. Really? So you know, we've had a multitude of, of different age groups and I've got, I've taken in, you know, I've had a couple of people come in at, at 30 because they were so ripe for this and they really honestly could have done a full-time PhD. They had the, the full capacity to do a PhD they were young, they were hungry, they had great ideas, but they couldn't quit their job. And so some people have to support family. Sure. Some people send all their money back to their parents in another country, so they can't quit their job. So we can help them by putting them in a, maybe a more academic track, some of those people, um, to really pushing them to go in a more academic direction with certain types of supervisors and, and projects. And um, so those are the, so I've got a mix of ages, but I'd say the youngest are 30 and then it goes, there's no age limit up. And uh, wow. so the experience should be managing people of some, in some form or some kind of, you know, pretty significant project management because when they're in the room with the others, it's, um, it's an impressive group of people. So we want them to feel comfortable in that group. Right. It doesn't have to be specifically in, in business though. Like if they were managing people, no. No, we have people from nonprofits, NGOs, people who've worked on humanitarian, a lot of uh, military and government. We have a lot of people from, especially from Middle Eastern countries getting qualifications, they're working in government. They're really like working on very specific problems of, of governance or of economics, right? So public, private sector, and um, no, it's anything to do really with organizations and managing organizational questions, right? Okay. And what about academic requirements? Is there a GMAT or GRE, academic background in business or specific other fields? What about those kinds of requirements? Can you touch on that? So, yeah, so that's good. So the PhD program at GEM does require GMAT or GRE. We do not because we assume that people, a lot of people have already done that. If they come in with a really good MBA, they've done that. Um, so you do, no require master's. Require. you do require a master's degree, right? So we require a master's degree with a preference for an MBA or a master's in a discipline such as finance, marketing, economics, et cetera. However, we take people with a master's in engineering or with master's in education or sociology. So we've got a mix. I mean, I even have someone with a, so we have anywhere from someone with a creative writing master's like an MFA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right or history okay. to people who are medical doctors we've had several medical doctors or people with PhDs in other subjects like engineering and then they ended up going into the business side 
for the, you know, some, some people just go on straight through and do a PhD when they're in their twenties, right? They can go. And so then they get to be in their fifties and they're, they want to do something else. And they'd rather teach what they've done, which is management, because once you move up in an organization, you know, you're no longer just a practitioner, subject matter, you know, you're not just the guru on the technical side. Right. So if you're an engineer or a finance person, you're actually not really always interacting on that level. You're managing organizational questions. Right. And then you start dealing with human, human problems, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and strategic problems. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. What gets you excited in a positive way about an applicant? About an applicant? Yeah, you, uh, so I, briefly, but I'd like, to go, I'd like to go back to that for a second. Well, see, I, I, I'm, you know, we're all different, right? So we come from different disciplinary backgrounds. So what gets me excited may not get everyone else in, in the committee excited because we're an admissions committee. They're a board. So we have to really all vet this applicant. But I'll tell you, the ones that excite me are the ones where I see a potential to, to address questions that are complex that are kind of what we'd call grand challenges. Right. So we have some grand challenges. We have, for example, problems of migration. And so one of the exciting projects that I've been looking at recently is a student working on diaspora. And, you know, diaspora is a huge problem. It's impacting a lot of countries like Lebanon, India, Armenia. And, you know, these are serious problems. These countries need to find ways to pull people back. So he's looking at how can you motivate people to repatriate? back to the country of origin, right? So he's looking at how it works and he's looking at alumni organizations role in that, for example. So that's a grand challenge, right? So those are the, you know, what are, people are looking at sustainability. People are looking at problems of, you know, migrant identity, because this is a worldwide problem. Uh, looking at, you know, environmental impact problems, right? And so all of those things can be examined, social responsibility, um, those, those big grand challenges to me are so exciting because then they're gonna have to go very, very narrow on a very specific empirical field that they study. So they're gonna study an organization or a specific context, and they're gonna try to glean from that information that then can be broadly applied to some of those grand challenges. They can join their voice in I think a very inspiring group of voices. And so that, that gets me excited personally, because those are the kind of areas I, I work on diversity. And so those are things that are important to me. Um, but I think when people are you know, looking from other fields, what we're all looking at is a, a doctoral project that is interdisciplinary in nature, that will allow the person to look across what other people are saying across disciplines. They may have to go look at you know, philosophy or psychology in right. order to understand what's happening. So we all look for some kind of theoretical richness that can be developed over time if they have a good initial idea. And I think this is really related to your, your last answer, but if, if I were, or any listener for that matter, were to say, you know, this sounds really interesting. I think I want to apply. What would you advise somebody thinking, gee, I, I think I really want to apply to, to do, to prepare themselves to submit a, a good application. They don't need to, oh, they need to send it for the GMAT or the GRE. Okay, so they have to do that. But I mean, I don't mean G, GMAT or GRE. I mean something a little more qualitative. Right. Well, what would, so what would help them? I would say that everything on the application is gonna be easy for them. Like they're gonna have to get their transcripts together and get letters of recommendation. What's gonna be more challenging is the research proposal. We look at three things, right? We look at academic qualifications. So we're looking for people who have done a good master's degree, they had good grades. We do look at bachelor's transcripts too, you know, but we're, we're really looking at what did you do after that? That's the first pillar, academic. The second is managerial. So we're looking at your experience and what you could bring. And that's always interesting because sometimes people have much stronger managerial experience than their academic side. And that, that's a pillar that moves up. But the third and most important one really for us is looking at the research potential. So that proposal is important. So I tell people, you're gonna, if you give yourself six months, that's great. If you don't have that much time, there are ways to accelerate. But I would say in any case, you will need to think, 
what we need to do, what we do in a doctorate that we don't have time to do in our everyday organizational lives that are extremely harried and I think extremely distracted today is we need to think. And, you know, Bertrand Russell said that, right? He said, I did everything I did in my career because I simply took my brain and used it by thinking. And what I mean by that is he didn't have any other distraction. He sat down in an armchair and thought about problems. And that's what we're asking people to do to write the proposal. Not to sit in the armchair all day, but to think about it. And you need to have that, you know, moment where you sit back and think, what if I, in my career, in my everyday environment, what are the things I observe that are interesting, that have struck me? Um, it's not what are other people working on that I can kind of latch on to, it's what's interesting to me. And when, you know, certain people will, are really, they're already reading about things and they're, they're thinking about things, but there, there's so many, there's a multitude of issues. So they have to find the ones that reverberate with them. So I would say, sit down and think about what are the things that when you read, do you see a pattern among the things that interest you and the things you read? Do you see, what are you recognizing in terms of things that are happening at work that are problems or that are some kind of interesting, you know, conundrum or paradox even? Paradoxes are interesting, right? Like what, is it contradictory? What's happening in organizations today? And so it usually does need to come from their experience. That's why they need to have some experience because they've had that, their intuition has been, I would say refined through watching things happen, right? And so they already have some intuitions about interesting things. They need to then go and look and see what's been written, but, but thinking about it first, engage with someone who you think knows about this subject, talk to people you trust who have written, right? Who can write about these things, who have ideas about these things. And don't be afraid to ask us, of course, or whoever you're applying to, for some advice on the best way to go about it. And we can help, but we also tell you, take your time and we can, it may not be perfect the first time you write. And we also will tell you, maybe you should talk to this person or that person. If we see you really have a great idea, um, you know, if you're saying, I wanna work on, on big data, facial recognition systems, it's a information systems pro problem. Well, maybe there's someone in our school we would put you in touch with if you seem to really be advanced on a question already and you need some direction. So we can do that, but I would tell someone, stop and think, look around you for resources who can help you because you'll need to socialize your idea, do some reading on it, and don't hesitate to reach out for more guidance, right? And to see a, what does a really good proposal look like, ask us for that and we can share. Great, okay. What's the question that I haven't asked that you wish I would have asked? Uh, maybe one of the questions that's really interesting to me is how can we involve more minorities or groups that are underrepresented in doctoral research? Go for it. All right. So we're looking to, and I think this is really important thing for us, uh, is to kind of broaden what we call perspective diversity or perspectival diversity in the academy so that we have people coming from really different backgrounds. And what I like about the DBA is there are people who don't have the same way of thinking about things. You have conversations with people. I mean, I'll just be very simple. Like, for example, in the U.S., we're very polarized on politics. And, you know, it's kind of an interesting place where people come together and they have very different ideas, especially let's look at the U.S. context. They'll come in from very different backgrounds. And doing doctoral work allows people to kind of engage on touchy subjects and have much more productive conversations. So I want to see more and more people from different perspectives, whether it be with more women, more people of color, more people from economically, let's say, less privileged backgrounds coming into programs like this, because they're going to bring in so much more, let's say, richness of diversity and perspective that's going to help us kind of question our assumptions. And that's what the Academy needs is to constantly be challenging its assumptions. So I think it'll be great. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for that. 
Dr. Miela, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. You've been very generous with your time, and I don't want to take any more advantage than I already have. Where can listeners and potential applicants learn more about GEMS DBA program? So if they Google um, Grenoble DBA France or GEM GEM DBA France, they'll find it. Um, so if I tell you it is H, so if you, you type in grenoble-em.com, you'll find our website and then you can find doctorate of business administration or DBA. So there are many ways to find us. And um, then they, they'll find contact, the contact person for our program is named Claire and Claire is just great in responding. So we have a team of people to help. Okay, great. And I'll, I'll give one more way they can they can find find you, and that is if you go to exhibit.com slash 315, which is the show today, um, we'll link to the website for the GEM DBA, and um, as well as to related articles and interviews. Listener, I want to thank you too for joining Dr. Michelle Miele and me for our 315th episode. Just a quick reminder, um, you can master the paradox at the heart of graduate admissions by downloading our free guide, Fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions. Grab your copy at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. And a final request, if you find the show worthwhile, please share the good word by leaving a review on iTunes. Your doing so helps us spread the word about Admissions Straight Talk. And there's a link in the show notes to our iTunes page where you can leave that review. And of course, if you want to leave a review somewhere else, that's fine too. Thanks again for coming. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Our theme music is provided by podcastthemes.com.